Thanks for joining us this morning. and share our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. experience. Happy Easter and happy Resurrection Sunday to each and every one of you. We're blessed by God to be here today and I'm excited about what God has in store. This is the day that the Lord has made and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. I'm so blessed that God has moved you to be here at this worship experience here where we're having corporate worship. Corporate worship simply means that we're not here up here to worship for you uh, our praise team and our worship leader is not here to worship to you, but we're indeed on this Easter Sunday here to worship with you. And so I want to encourage you today to immerse yourself into the worship experience. And the way that you do that is you get in a posture of worship, which is why we ask you to stand throughout our praise and worship. And then I want you to sing every song that we have. The words are going to be up. As soon as you get the tune a little bit, I want you to join our praise team and join our worship leader in singing songs to God. Because today is about the victory that we have in God. Today is about the victory over the enemy, over the adversary, and over the devil. And if ever there was a reason we could worship and sing for God, we ought to be able to sing God to God for our victory on today. I'm excited about those of you joining virtually today. Let's give God some praise and wave uh, to our virtual audience. If you're virtual today, we don't just want you to be worshipers. We want you to be witnesses. So please like, hit that thumbs up, that red and white heart. But also we would love for you to share right now. Somebody just woke up and they're just scrolling aimlessly through Facebook. And they're going to see this praise team in these pastels. And they're going to get ready to praise God. So help us uh, invite your family and friends by sharing. Before we go to God uh, and in praise, let's go to God in prayer. So everybody, let's bow our head and let's close our eyes. God, today we love you and we honor you. We thank you today for the occasion that brings us into this worship experience. We thank you today that, God, you looked at death and said, Death, oh, where is your power? And death, where is your sting? Today, God, we're celebrating, God, your resurrection in Christ Jesus, God. 
And today, God, because Jesus rose, God, we've gotten up out of our beds. We've come up into the church, and we're going to raise our voice, God. We're going to raise our hand, and we're going to raise our worship, God, until angels in heaven will dance. Today, God, we ask that you give us spiritual and worship strength, God. Give us the stamina to bless you today, God. Give us the stamina to worship you today, God. And God, give us the memory to remember all the things that you have done in our life, God. Today, as we close this series and we begin this Resurrection Sunday, we pray that your anointing would plaster this place from the roof to the foundation and to the from the ceiling to the floor, God. We don't want a crack to have, not have your anointing. We don't want a corner to be absent from your anointing. We don't want a crevice to be absent from your anointing. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Fall on our hopes today, God. Fall on our burdens today, God. Fall on our dreams today, God. Fall on our families today, God. Fall on our aspirations today, God. Fall on our heart today, God. Fall on our mind today, God. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. God, we love you today. And because we love you, we're spending the next moments and minutes of our life showing you just how much. This in the loving, liberating, and life-giving name of Jesus we pray. Let all who believe in love say, amen. And if you're ready to worship God, would you just begin to put your hands together and give God some praise? Life has to say We want y'all to sing with us, all right? So I'm going to start by teaching a little bit of something that goes at the end. And I want you to just follow with me, all right? If you're with me and you just want to bless God with your praise today, somebody say hallelujah. Let's lift it high. Oh, wait a minute. I got like two out of ten. Somebody say hallelujah. Let's lift it high. All right. That's five out of ten. I need ten out of ten. Somebody think about the goodness of God and let me get a hallelujah in this place. There we go. Yes, that's it. That's it. Follow us here. Listen. Said, I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. Who I am. Do it again. I know. I know, I know, said I know, I, I know who I am. Think about the goodness of God. I know, I know what I know, I know. Tell somebody, I know, I, I know who I am. Who Tell somebody I else, am. say I know, I know, said I know, I know. We're going back to the top. I know. I who I am, I got evidence, I've got evidence, I've got confidence, I'm a yep. I know that I went I know I know I in his pen Conquer the enemy. He wrote in my destiny that my name is victory. He said that I'd overcome. I know I've already won. He wrote in my destiny that my name is victory. I know. I know. I can. God wrote it in his plan. God wrote it. Well, One more in you. Oh, 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 oh. My name is You know what? Let's do that section again. Uh, God gave me authority to conquer the enemy. He wrote in your destiny that my name is He said that I don't. Then my name is Victory. I don't say I know who I am. I wrote it in his plan for me. Say, oh, 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 oh. 
I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know who I am. Who I am. We'll say I know, I know, yes, I know, I know, I know, I know who I am. Who I am. Said I know, I know, I know, declare it. One more time. Say, I know. I know. I know. I know. Oh, I know. I know. Victory, say victory, 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 victory. That's my name. That's my name. Oh, victory. King, say it with me. Say, I'm a child, I'm a child of the Most High God, of the Most High God. Say, I'm a child, I'm a child of the King, of the King. Everybody say, I'm a child, I'm a child. of the Most High God, of the Most High God. I'm a child, I'm a child of the King. Now give God some praise. Someone sing and say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory, honor and power to the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is almighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, he is wonderful. This ain't no script. Let's do that part again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. Power, yeah. 
All right. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. He is wonderful. Everybody say hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Let's do it again. Hallelujah, everybody. Yes. Hallelujah. Hey, 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 hey. Hallelujah. Right here. Yeah. He is one. You are wonderful and mighty, oh God. You are mighty and wondrous, oh King. I don't have enough words in my simple vocabulary to say how much I love you, Lord. I can say that I adore you, but that's not enough. I can say that I need you, but it's not enough. I can say that you're good, but it's not enough. All power, all glory, all honor, all go to you, O oh, King of kings. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, 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 praises, Lord. Thank you for your sacrifice, O King. Thank you for being a very real God. Y'all keep worshiping. It's between you and the Lord right now. We can move to the next. Father, we thank you for being a very real God for our very real situations. Father, we thank you for being our healer, our strength, our peace. God, we thank you for moving in our families in such a way that we know that it is you, oh God, that is healing, oh God. We, it is you, oh God, that is bringing our family members to relationship with you. All we're going to do is get out of your way, oh King, and bless you with all we have when we see the victory, oh God. Thank you for all that you are. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for your great mercy. Thank you for your grace that is sufficient. And Father God, we thank you for your love. There is no great love, no great love than the one you have for me, Lord. There is no great love, no great love than the one you have for me oh your mercy so tender erasing my there is oh your mercy so tender Erasing my, there is, there is 
no greater love, no greater love than the one you have for me, Lord. Mercy, so tender, erasing my there is, oh, there is none. Oh, your mercy, so tender, erasing my transgression. Like we started with, Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. That's love. That's love. Just think about that. Meditate right there for a bit. Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. That's love. Ooh, that's love. Oh, that's love. Jesus went to Calvary. Oh, the same like you and me. That's love. That's love. They hung him high. Stretched him wide. 
story ends. Story ends. Three days later, he rose again. That's love. That's love. Just keep singing that in the background. That's love. You all keep singing that praise team. And then I'm about to give us our refrain right here in the audience. You heard it in the song before. Praise team, keep right there. But from the congregation, I want you to remind yourself this right here. Keep singing that right there. But we're going to say, your love for me is forever. Your love for me is forever. Sing that to God. Your love for me is forever. Your love for me is forever. Sing with me. Your love for me is forever. Your love for me is forever. That's what blesses me. Yeah. Your love for me is forever. That no matter what I do, God, you love me. No matter how wrong I've been, God, you love me. No matter how many mistakes I've made today, God, you love me. No matter how far away I've been from your church, from your presence, from my prayer life, I'm reminded today, your love for me is forever. Your love for me is forever. Your love for me is forever. And that's why I'm worshiping you today, God, because you love me forever, God. Your grace is forever, God. Your mercy is forever, God. Your deliverance is forever, God. Your presence is forever, God. Your power is forever, God. And the fact that you can love me better than I can love myself, God, that's love today, God. If we don't have any other reason to worship you, God, I want to worship you for how well you love me, God. If we don't have any other reason to praise you today, God, I want to praise you because you love me, God. God, when I didn't love myself, you loved me, God. When friends turned their back on me, you loved me, God. When family turned their back on me, you loved me, God. God, we honor you today and we worship. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. That's love. God, we bless you. We honor you for this hour. We thank you for this day. 
And today, God, we pause right now, God, on this Easter Sunday to be reminded that everything that happened on that hill far away is a representation, God, of how much you love us. That you would come on the earth for us. That you would suffer hardship for us. That you would suffer betrayal for us. God, we love you and we honor you today, God. And God, now, God, as we come into this moment where we preach your word, we pray that your spirit would fall fresh on us. The spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on every man and woman that's under the sound of my voice right now. There's something, God, that we need, God, to live better lives tomorrow. And so, God, we pray that you would open our spirits, our hearts, and our minds to whatever it is, God. Whatever reason you brought us into this worship experience, whatever reason we pulled up to 349 Kenwood Road, for whatever reason we open our YouTube or our Facebook, God, God, let it manifest itself right now. God, don't let us walk away from this worship experience empty, God. But God, I pray right now for every man and for every woman who can hear my voice that you would fill them right now with your word, your will, and your way, God. God, there's someone who needs you, God. There's someone who has been tired. There's someone who has walked away from you. But God, this moment right now, God, is to draw us nearer to you, God. And so that's our prayer, God, that you would draw us nearer when we read the scripture, that you would draw us nearer when we hear the word, and that you would draw us nearer as we leave the premises. God, draw us nearer to you. This is our prayer. We pray it in the loving, liberating, and life-giving name of Jesus. Amen, and thank God. Amen, amen. You may be seated all over the building. Let's give God some praise all over the building. Amen. Let's praise God for our praise team and our worship leader. Amen, amen. Let's give God some praise for Glue, our band. We praise God for you today. We bless God for your presence and for all that God is doing with you and through you. Let's give God some praise for our parking lot ambassadors who met us in the parking lot and our ushers in their living love t-shirts. We praise God. For each and every one of you, to those in the sound and media, we bless God for you. And I, um, I bless God that each and every one of you got up early this morning and joined us for this Easter worship experience where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I am, I'm just blessed, blessed for you to be here and I'm blessed to be here. Y'all, y'all know I've told you, this is the Christian Super Bowl for me. Amen, amen. If you can't get excited for nothing else. We got to get excited for Easter, and so I'm excited about what God has done. Uh, I want to really get right into it because I don't want to hold you long. Um, I praise God for you today, uh, and I praise God for this series that we have been that leads us into this moment where we have been recounting and relooking at the life and the ministry of Jesus. And as we've looked Sunday in and Sunday out for the entirety of the month of March, one of the things that we have found is that it is no surprise to us that Jesus ends up on this cross. Because what we have found is throughout Jesus' ministry, throughout his life, throughout his public walk, and throughout his teaching and his preaching, we have discovered that from almost day one, Jesus was really eluding the grips and the grasp of death. 
that in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus does one of his first acts of reading and foreshadowing and what many believe is giving his mission statement in Luke chapter 4, the Bible says that afterwards there's a ruckus and the crowd, this is early in his ministry, literally run him and drive him out of the temple. They run him and drive him out of the temple and then the Bible says they attempted to throw him off of a cliff to his peril. I mean, y'all, this is before the Sermon on the Mount. This is before the five loaves of bread and two catfish were turned and fed five. I mean, Jesus hadn't even got bit started yet. And Jesus is almost thrown off of a cliff. Then later in his ministry, he's preaching and he's in the temple. And literally stones are picked up against Jesus as the leaders of the church are about to exercise capital punishment. And somehow Jesus still gets away from that. And then we look on in other stories and it says people began to conspire about how they could kill him. This is while church is going on, y'all. Imagine that, that Jesus is in church uh, and he is preaching and teaching and healing. And the leaders are in the back conspiring about how to diminish and to destroy our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then we find that finally in Luke 20 last week, the conspiracy finally finds a manifestation into a plan. They then began to send spies into Jesus' ministry to walk with Jesus in his camp to look Jesus in the face and laugh at his jokes, uh, to say amen to his sermons, to give him high fives and to laugh and chuckle with him over meals so that Jesus might think that those in his circle who mean him well he might get comfortable with enough to expose himself enough so that the leaders can kill him. Jesus' ministry is full of hardship. Jesus' ministry is full of attack. Jesus' ministry is full of frustration. Jesus' ministry is full of conflict. Jesus' ministry is full of affliction. And this weekend reminds us just how far it went. If you don't remember the story, Jesus is arrested, and he is arrested on Thursday night, and he begins to be tried. He's tried by Pilate. Pilate doesn't know what to do with him. Pilate sends him to Herod. Herod doesn't know what to do with him. Herod sends him back to Pilate, and Pilate is really ready to release Jesus after a beating, and what he believes is that will satisfy the mob and the majority. Yet the mob says, no, beating is not enough. No, jail time is not enough. There's nothing that will suffice us but to experience Jesus murdered and killed. And so the rest goes into history. They begin to beat Jesus. And they begin to flog Jesus. They begin to mock Jesus. They begin to spit on Jesus. Hours and hours, Jesus experiences this torture, and then it is time for him to receive the crowning moment of his punishment, which is capital punishment and death on a cross. Jesus now is made to carry his own cross, and the Bible and and it says uh, that he carries his own cross. And my forefathers and foremothers said, and then they marched him up a hill. Yeah, that's what we used to say at Sweet Home Baptist Church. They used to sing that song. They say he never said a mumbling word. And so here Jesus now is, battered, bloodied, and bruised, and crossed on him so much that he cannot carry it anymore. And if that was not enough, when they put him on the cross, they nail his hands, they nail his feet, they pierce his sides, they put a crown over his head, and it is so bad that blood starts streaming down and tears start falling down as people in the, on the bottom of the hill get to watch what's on top of a hill. And at this moment here, all those who've conspired feel like they won. All those who tried to run him out the church and throw him off a cliff feel like we finally got him. 
all those who were conspiring, all those who picked up stones, all those who tried to arrest him earlier, all those who sent spies into his camp, they feel like, look, now we almost had him in chapter 4. We almost had him in John. We almost had him in Luke 19. We almost had him in Luke 20. But now we see the blood streaming from his forehead. We see the blood streaming from his hands. We see the blood streaming from his feet. And so now, if ever Jesus has been God, we have him right now. The Bible says, even Jesus says, it is finished. And they take him down from the cross and put him in a tomb. In some ways, you all, I want to pause right here because this series has been for the purpose and the point of reminding us that we are not alone in our experience of hardship. If we're to be honest, the reason that many of us, when we get to fade away from the presence of God, it is usually because we experience some type of betrayal, some type of loss, some type of rejection, some type of frustration, some type of hardship. And if I was making a point and you're making notes, write this down, I would argue that the importance of this series is to point out the importance of the commonality we have with Christ. That it is important that you understand that you're not the first person to be mad at the church. It is important that you understand that you are not the first person to be conspired against. It is important that you understand that you're not the first person to have people in your circle who ought to be about your flourishing, but who are really about your destruction. That you are not the first person to have almost encounters with the enemies. And it is important for us to recognize and realize that if anybody understands hardship, Jesus Christ does. That we are not alone in our frustration with the church. We are not alone if we have suffered human attacks. We are not alone if we've ever suffered from betrayal or rejection. Imagine that for just a second. Sit in that, if you will, for just a moment and meditate on that for just a little while. God robes God's self in flesh and shows up for us in the form of Jesus. And look at how Jesus is treated. Somebody here needs to be, know that you are not. Listen to this. If you mad at God for what people did in the church. Imagine how God, mad God is about what people do and did in the church. Here Jesus is. He has experienced being driven out of the church. He has experienced the attempt to throw him off of a cliff. He has been approached by a group of people who picked up stones to kill him. There is an attempt to arrest him long before Gethsemane and Peter tries to cut the man's ear off. Leaders of the church have conspired against him. He's already had his frustration with preachers and pastors. He's already been mad at deacons and trustees because he understands what it feels like to be in at odds with the leaders of the church. People are sent to be a part of his inner circle to spy on him and betray his trust. Can I tell you all, life for Jesus has not been no crystal stair. And just like many of us who allow our hardships, our frustrations, our betrayals to get us away from Jesus, I am arguing that if we take the commonality of our lives with Christ's life seriously, our hardship really ought to be what gets us closer to God. For many of us, our rejection gets us further away from God, but if we take this commonality seriously, we really ought to be closer to God. Every time we get betrayed, we ought to step closer to Jesus. Every time somebody gets on our nerves, we ought to step closer to Jesus. Every time we're rejected, we ought to step closer to Jesus. Every time we get mad at the church, we ought to step closer to Jesus. Because the point of this series is 
that we have not experienced any pain and hardship in our life that Jesus did not experience in his life. But just listen to this. As we are not alone in the discomfort, I've also come to tell somebody we're not alone in the deliverance. One of the things that we've celebrated over and over this past month is every time the enemy connives, manipulates, and maneuvers to get Jesus in one place, the Lord somehow finds a way for Jesus to get out of it. But just as we are not alone in the discomfort, we are not alone in the deliverance. Just like Jesus slipped away from some of his enemies, there are some of us who slipped away from some consequences, uh, slipped away from some results, slipped away from some adversaries. Just as we are not alone in the discomfort, we are not alone in the deliverance. Beloved, your presence here today, whether actual or virtual, it suggests that you have made it through something. If I could go and shine an inward microscope on each and every one of your lives, I guarantee I don't have to get all in your business to realize real fast that all of us are here and we have made it through something. You've been delivered from something. You've been kept from something. You've been protected from something. You've been saved from something. You have survived something. You have made it through something. You have, made, you have battled through something. You have got gotten through something. Now, I don't know what your something is, but I do know if you're here today, it is because you have gotten over some river. You have climbed over some mountain. You have walked through some valley. And affliction and adversity and misfortune, although it almost got you, your presence today suggests that the almost is in your life. Do not count. It's the importance. There's the, that's the importance, listen to this, of the commonality. That's the first thing that what this series has been try, trying to do is establish for all of us that even if we are frustrated at how humans behave in the church, even if our distance from our relationship with God or the church is a result of our frustration with people, then really that really puts us right in the shoes of Jesus. Because this is Jesus' experience in the church. Jesus keeps coming to church, and Jesus keeps getting frustrated. Jesus keeps coming to church, and Jesus keeps coming and getting attacked. And as we said two weeks ago, and here's the thing, and if Jesus can stick with the church, if Jesus can stick with people who come together to serve God, if, if Jesus can stay with the assembly of God, then what I want to argue is so can we. I like this text and this weekend because we've looked all this time at the almosts of the enemy, but there is no almost that is more almost er than what happens this weekend. Oh, I made that up, but it, you, you got what I meant. There is no almost that is more almost-er than when Jesus gets in the cross. In fact, beloved, here's what I want to argue in my mind. It was not the cross that made his enemies begin to celebrate. Because I believe that somewhere in the Roman government, just like in all forms of capital punishment, there's people who've gotten in an electric chair and somehow made it past the initial shot of electricity. I have to believe that all the times that the Roman people have killed someone, they believe someone was dead, took the cross down, got them off the cross, felt their pulse, and said, oh my goodness, <laughs> we still got someone who's not dead. So I don't believe it was the cross that made people believe that they had Jesus. I don't even believe it was the blood. I don't believe it was the nails. But here's what I do believe. I do believe that when they took him off the cross and they put him in the tomb, everybody who was Jesus' enemy said, we finally got him. Then they took a deep breath. The devil took a deep breath because the devil was like, listen, all this hard work and we finally got him. I didn't know when he was marching up the hill, I wasn't sure. He had gotten out of a lot of things. I didn't know if he was going to get out of that. When we nailed him to the cross, I was almost there, but I wasn't sure. Because we've nailed people to the cross before. And we took them down, and they still had a pulse. But now that he's in the tomb, and the rock has been rolled away, the enemy began to celebrate and began to dance. The enemy began to celebrate 
because he was like, I finally got it. The Christians can finally give up. The disciples can finally pack it in. The followers of Jesus can finally walk away because the tomb was almost Jesus' truth. And when we look back at our life, many of us have had some tomb moments. We've had some moments we didn't think we could rebound from. We had some moments that we didn't think we could make it over. The tomb is somebody's divorce. Somebody, when you got divorced, you didn't recognize and you didn't believe you'd ever find joy again. You'd ever find love again. All of us have a tomb moment. For some of our tomb, it's when mama or daddy died. We didn't know how we were going to go on. We didn't know how we were going to go forward. Or maybe we had the death of a child. For some, our cancer is some of our tomb. For some, friends' betrayal is our tomb. The tomb is any place where the world believes that we should be counted out. But the good news about today is that we encounter a text that says on the first week at early dawn in Luke 24, it said they came to the tomb. The tomb is the place where Jesus is over and took spices that they had prepared. Now, in case you don't know, these are not spices for alive people. These are spices for dead people. That means not only the enemies thought they had won, Jesus' friends thought it was over, thought the devil had won. And so they got the death spices. They don't tell us what the spices were, y'all. They don't say if it was rosemary or oregano. They don't tell us what the spices were. They don't tell us if it was herb or mint. But here's what we do know. We do know they had to be death spices uh, because they didn't use, uh, use uh, spices for live people uh, in a tomb. Uh, and so here they come with the spices uh, and the Bible says uh, that the same rock uh, and the same tomb uh, that they thought uh, was the certificate for Jesus' death uh, the Bible says they found that tomb uh, and that rock uh, rolled away. Yeah, I wish I could just stop right there uh, because that's enough to leave with you right there. Right. Anybody here uh, ever found God uh, who took your tomb uh, and rolled it away? Uh, took the depression uh, and rolled it away? Uh, took the cancer and rolled it away? Uh, took the heartache uh, and rolled it away? Uh, it says when they went in, uh, they did not find the body. Uh, and they were perplexed about this. Um, and two men uh, in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified, bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? <laughs> In other words, what they said, why do you look for the delivered amongst the depressed? Why do you look for the sad amongst those who have joy? Why do you look for the healed amongst the people who are hurting? Jesus, then they said, uh, he is not here, uh, but he has uh, risen. Uh, the tomb uh, was almost Jesus' truth. Uh, but can I tell you, uh, we didn't come to church today uh, because of the tomb. Uh, we didn't get dressed up today uh, because of the tomb. Uh, we didn't come to church for the first time in a long time uh, because of the tomb. Uh, we didn't pull into 349 Kenwood uh, because of the tomb. Uh, we're not on Facebook and YouTube because of the tomb. The tomb was the enemy's truth. But God had a truth after the tomb. And so what they thought was Jesus' truth, the same tomb became his testimony. Anybody here know that's how God's works? The same divorce that you thought was your tomb ended up being your testimony. The same people that rejected you that you thought were your tomb ended up being your testimony. The same death that they thought was your tomb ended up being your testimony. The same layoff that you thought was your tomb ended up being your testimony. We're here today to celebrate a God who can get us out of anything and allow us to rise again. 
Jesus in the 24th chapter of Luke is not there because he has risen and I believe that just like Jesus rose then God is still rising people right now I'm looking at a room full of risen people risen from depression risen from sadness risen from sickness risen from unemployment risen from family breakdown you're in the tomb the tomb is not our truth but it is our testimony listen I'm through I'm through I'm almost through thank you so much for almost, listen to this, for every, for every almost, this is what I found, that we ought to celebrate the commonality. But this series is also to talk about what really ought to count. Now why is that important? Because so many times, we look at those things that almost got the best of us, and those are the things that we let drive our personality. We look at those things that almost, the almost moments where the enemy took over our life. And for some reason, those are the things that mar our spirit. We look at the negative things, the, the family rejection, the, the breakup with my, with my parents, the, the time I got laid off, the, the moment I dropped out of school, the, the time my marriage or the relationship didn't work, the time I got sick, the time the church failed me. All of these moments where the enemy is moving in our life, we find those almost moments and we allow them to count more than what I want to argue are the absolute moments. Follow me here and we'll be done. For every almost Brandon Perkins, there has to be an absolutely. Y'all don't believe that, do you? <laughs> For every almost in our life, there has to be an antithetical absolutely to exist. Because for something to almost happen, there has to be something that absolutely happened. For something to almost happen on one end, something has to absolutely happen on another end. In other words, if you almost hit a target, you absolutely missed. <laughs> if, if, if you almost won a game, <laughs> you absolutely lost it. I hate to do this to Atlanta fans, but you remember in the Super Bowl when we were up on New England Patriots 28 to 3 and we cried that day from Atlanta. People drove away from Houston, Texas, and you know what they said? We almost won. But the reason we know we almost won is because New England absolutely won. If you almost died, that means you absolutely lived. And that's all I'm trying to tell somebody is that for every almost in your life, there is a, an antithetical absolutely. If the enemy almost stole your joy, <laughs> that means God absolutely helped you keep it. And this joy that I have, the world did not give it and the world cannot take it away. For every almost, uh, there is an absolutely. Uh, and I want somebody to walk out of here today uh, not focusing on the almost of the enemy, uh, but focusing on the absolutes of God. Uh, I want somebody to leave church today uh, giving God some praise, uh, not because of the almost of the enemy, uh, but blessing God uh, for the absolutes of God's help. Uh, our almost encounters with the enemy uh, means that we've absolutely had an encounter with God. Uh, and if you don't have any reason uh, to get excited on Easter Sunday, uh, you ought to praise God uh, that the almost uh, of the tomb uh, is the absolutely uh, of God's uh, resurrection. It's our absolute encounters that count. God absolutely woke me up this morning. God absolutely kept me out of harm's way. God absolutely gave me joy today. God absolutely has given me another chance. How do you know that God has absolutely won in your life? 
breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. And if you can breathe in and breathe out, then God has absolutely won every battle. If you can breathe in and breathe out, then God has defeated every enemy. If you can breathe in and breathe out, then God has won every victory. And that's the reason to give God some praise. I'm not going to let uh, the almost of the devil uh, stifle uh, the absolutes of God. Uh, I absolutely uh, give you praise. I'm through, y'all. <laughs> That's not enough for some of y'all, though. That's not enough for some of y'all. The absolutes of your life and the almost of your life are not enough. That's why I want to leave you with this. In the spring of 1966, in the spring of 1966, right outside of Houston, Texas, at a school they called the School on the Hill. <laughs> the school is HBCU called Prayer View A&M University. Prayer View A&M University, Brandon Perkins, is on the hill. And in the spring of 1966, a young lady left campus unauthorized and miss check-in and miss curfew now listen when she missed check-in and curfew at this time y'all know HBCUs were a little bit stricter they didn't let you just go when you wanted to go and leave when you wanted to leave and so the proper punishment for someone leaving campus unauthorized and being unaccounted for off of campus was expulsion Spring of 1966, a young lady went in front of the dean knowing that she could potentially be expelled from school because they had an unauthorized leave from the campus. But somehow, in the conversations with the dean, decided that they were going to give her grace <laughs> and give her another chance. Now, when I was talking this month about almost, we began to ask, Give me some almost experiences in your life where God showed up and God showed out. Found out that that lady in the spring of 1966 was none other than my mama, Vandress Jackson. I learned something about my mama this month that I had never known before. That she was that close to being expelled from Prairie View. Now that doesn't bless you. <laughs> But this may, my mama went to Prairie View and Prairie View gave her her first job in Bastrop, Texas. When she got her first job in Bastrop, Texas, she began to teach a woman named Belinda and Benita and Beverly. Now Belinda and Benita and Beverly had an older brother named Barry. <laughs> And Barry, wanted, they wanted to introduce my mama the, to their older brother, Barry. So Barry meets Vantress uh, at the urging of Benita, Beverly, and Belinda. The, and then they decide they like each other. Barry and Vantress get married. Uh, and in the spring of 1976, uh, they have a child named Bashan. Now, Bashan comes along, uh, and in 2008, uh, uh, Constance Scott starts Fellowship of Love Church. Uh, and in 2024, uh, all of us uh, are in Fellowship of Love Church. Uh, and some of us uh, can't give God praise uh, for the almost in our life. Uh, but maybe if I remind you uh, that the absolute presence of us today uh, is on the footsteps uh, of God working in 1966 uh, at Prayer View uh, on a hill. Uh, in other words, uh, our presence uh, is on the back uh, of so many almost moments uh, that God had. Uh, that we've never even seen, uh, never even acknowledged, uh, never even gave God praise for. Uh, that's why I like when the old folks say, uh, I want to bless God uh, for blessing seen uh, and unseen. Uh, what I'm trying to tell you uh, is if your almost is not enough, uh, your grandmother got an almost, uh, that if God didn't work uh, the almost in her life, uh, 
you wouldn't be yeah, here today yeah, if you can't bless God uh, for what God almost did in your life. Uh, you ought to think about our foremothers and our forefathers uh, and begin to bless God uh, for what God did uh, in their life. Uh, God absolutely yeah, had our back. Uh, God absolutely yeah, cleared our path. Uh, God absolutely. I'm through. I'm through. Listen to this. I'm through. Listen to this. And here's the question. Here's the question that I want you to leave with. The importance of this series is to point out the importance of our commonality with Christ. The importance of this series is to point out what absolutely counts. Here's the final thing. If we can agree that what really counts is not how we were almost taken out, but what really counts is how we were absolutely saved. No matter what you've been through, and I have no doubt you've been through a lot, no matter how frustrated you've been, and I have no doubt you've been very frustrated, no matter how many trials and tribulations you've had, and I have no doubt you've had many trials and tribulations, what I've been trying to argue this whole month is you're here is what counts. The fact that you have survived it, that's what counts. The fact that Jesus got up and rose again, that's what counts. We might not be here today if the tomb was the truth. We might not be here today if the nails had the last word. But they didn't. And that's what's counted for us enough to be here today. Here is the question that we leave the month of March with. And here's the question I want to put on your shoulders. How do I make what counts? How do I make that count? I know I'm slow too. Let me say it again. Since God has delivered me from so much, since God has protected me from so much, since God has preserved me from, from so much, how do I make that count? That's the question that ought to be on the, the balcony and the porch of our heart as we leave here today. Since what God has absolutely done is what counts, how do I make that count? What do I do with the rest of my life to make sure that what counts, counts. How do I honor the resurrection, the deliverance, the salvation of God? And how do I make it count in my life? How do I serve? Who do I forgive? What goal, what dream do I fulfill? What ambition do I run after? What discipline do I exercise to make the absolute salvation of God count in my life? 
whether you are part of the church or not a part of the church, that question is for you. Whether you're a member of a church or not a member of a church, that question is for you. How do I make it count? How do I make my life that God has protected and preserved in this moment? How do I make it count? Today I'm praying that just like Jesus rose some 2,000 years ago, God is waiting for something to rise in you so that you can make the salvation of God count. God is waiting for the book you're supposed to write, for the business you're supposed to open, for the family you're supposed to start, for the church you're supposed to join, for the ministry that you're supposed to serve, so that you can make the absolute salvation of God, the protection of God, the preservation of God count in your life and in this world. Every head bowed, every eye closed, God, we love you today and we honor you. And now, God, we're praying that you help us and move us to make what you've done in the world count. God, today as we walk away from this series, we pray that we'll leave the doors, turn off our computers, close our laptop with a made-up mind that we're going to allow your deliverance to count. God, what we do with the rest of our lives, it matters and it makes your salvation and your resurrection count. And so God, I'm praying for some man or some woman who's been hesitating on saying yes to you. I'm praying for some man or some woman who, even though they've been absent and away from the church, you have absolutely looked after them, looked over them and protected them. I'm praying for some man or some woman even though they've not been in their prayer life They've not been exercising their spiritual regime. They've not been meditating, fasting, eating well, exercising. But God, right now, we're under the realization that no matter what we've done, you have absolutely stuck by our side. And now, God, we want to make that count. And so, God, I'm asking that you move someone to make a decision, a decision to become closer to you, a decision to worship you better, a decision to serve you more, a decision to love you with more power and more consistency, a decision to join your church, a decision to join the minute, a decision to be baptized. Whatever our decision is, God, may it make your absolute salvation, your absolute deliverance, may it make it count. This is our prayer. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're standing here today, I want to give you an invitation. There may be someone who needs to make a decision. There may be someone who needs prayer. There may be someone who decides right now, God, I've been away from the church. I really just came just to come to Easter, Lord, but now I've been convicted that I want to make your presence in my life count and so if you've made a decision because you put that QR code up both on the screen and virtually if there's someone here right now who's making or who needs to make a decision maybe your decision I don't know what God wants me to do I just want somebody to pray for me whatever your decision is I want to invite you to scan the QR code that you see next to me virtually that you see on this screen physically because this QR code, beloved, is your portal to the next step in your spiritual life. If you've made a decision today, you want to know more about the church, if you want to join the church, if you want prayer, if you want baptism, if you want to accept the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior today, this QR code is your portal to say yes to God. If you're virtual today, 
you need to be a part of a virtual church, this QR code is your portal to say yes to God. Listen to this. There's some other people who need to know about this QR code while I'm here. If today you're a first-time guest, you've never been at this church before, I want you to scan this QR code. The same form will show you where to mark. We want to know if today is your first time here at Fellowship of Love. I want you to use this QR code, whether you're virtual or whether you're live in attendance, to let us know today was my first time, and I just wanted you to know that I was here today. If you're a first-time guest virtually, not only can you use this QR code, but you can go into the comments and put hashtag FTG. That stands for first-time guests. And of course, if you want to connect, if somehow this QR code is too intimidating, if you're a first-time guest, please go to the back corner before you leave. In that corner where it says hashtag connect with us, you'll find a connection host. And we want to leave with you a gift if you're physically here. If you're physically here, we want to leave you with a gift so that when you leave here, you'll have something to remember us by. If today's your first time here at Fellowship of Love Church, go by. We have one cup for every household. Go by right there in the corner where it says hashtag connect with us and receive the gift that we have for all of those who are here today for the first time. As you're contemplating decision, another way to respond and to continue in worship to God is to offer our resources and let God be a beneficiary of our divine generosity. And so at this time, I want to invite those of you who may want to give, to give our offering. Now, we won't take a formal offering. We don't walk around and we don't pass buckets. We actually encourage you to give electronically. If you don't have an electronic gift and you're live, our ushers are here with the envelopes. You can raise your hand and they'll bring you an envelope if you have a check or you have cash. But for those of you who, are, who aren't intimidated by digital giving, let me give you a few ways you can give. One, you can go to our website, www.fellowshipoflovechurch.org. Second, you can text. You text this number, 770-758-3652, and just put give in the text message. You'll receive a link, and you'll be able to give that way. Finally, and this is whether you're giving or not, we want to encourage you before you leave to download the Fellowship of Love Church app. This app is an evolving and a growing instrument. It's an instrument we want to give to anybody who's a believer or anybody who's even on the fence of believing. This app, ushers, I believe somebody, this app right there will help you, will guide you. It's soon to have a Bible there. It has a way for us to get in touch with you. It has a way for you to get in touch with us. But you can also use our app to give. If you need a place to give, you can go through our app and give today. I want to I want to thank each and every one of you for being here today on this Easter and Resurrection Sunday. I want to pray God's grace and God's peace as you celebrate the rest of the day with your family, with lunch, with brunch, whatever you're going to do for this Easter. Watching the tournament today, I pray your team wins. Uh, but with that being said, we're grateful for you, but we want to leave how we came, and that's worshiping God. So wherever you are, let's just stand. And let's lift our voices this last time. over the building. Your love for me is great to me. To me there is a great to me. To I want you to walk to work tomorrow saying your love for me. Now as we go to our many different destinations, I pray that God would bless you and I pray that God would keep you. I pray that God would lift God's countenance over you and be gracious unto you.
May God shine the very face of God on your very life. And may God give you peace. Peace in your home and in your family. Peace at your job and at your school. Peace in your spirit and in your relationships. Peace wherever you may go. In the loving, liberating, life-giving name of Jesus. Please remember, beloved, to live in love. Amen. Go in peace, beloved, and enjoy Easter Sunday. Depending on no you. Way.